Sylvia and me. 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 So the other point relating to the what we were talking about before is just that women, as women, we often underestimate ourselves. And, and that's why the message is about going forward. Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me. Conversations with inspiring, empowering women. Hi, Sylvia. I'm Mimi Zeman. I'm an OBGYN and author. My new memoir is called Tap Dancing on Everest, and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you. Welcome to Sylvia and me. Mimi, I am I am so delighted that you have the time to be with me here today because you're not just an OBGYN, you're an author. Your latest book, Tap Dancing on Everest, A Young Doctor's Unlikely Adventure, and it probably... If we go into it a little more, people will understand why a young doctor's unlikely adventure, you were still in med school. You were third year uh, med student, and yet you were the doctor on this expedition to Mount Everest, uh, the only woman in there. And what I want to do is you talk about, you managed to take so much into this story, into, into your latest uh, book, the memoir, and you use so many aspects of your life. And it's so many things that some of us have experienced and some of us haven't. But it's a coming of age, there's feminism in there, there's medicine, you intersect all of that with adventure and nature. So one of the things that I do want to start off with is something that you start off with in the book. And to me, it seems that it's one of the most important, if, if one of the most important, as there are many, you talk about uh, you put the scene up of your mother putting on a girdle. And I want to talk about how body image and food and so on affected a lot of your life. But there is one piece uh, at the beginning of the book that I do want to read. And you say, our bodies defining us, composing us, clenching memories within our casings of skin, sometimes trust in girdles. Our bodies, our first consciousness, my body, so much a part of my story, my body, my map. That really framed a lot of who you were, who you are. Can you tell us why that scene was so important for you to put in and how that really affected you throughout life. Sure. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think we live in our bodies, yet often have a really hard time relating to them. And at another point, I say my body almost feels like my conjoined twin, part of me, but not me. And that my goal when I hiked, when I danced, when I did meditation was to become one and the same. My early memories of my body kind of frame this idea of why it was unlikely for me to go to Everest. I was born premature, put in an incubator, had casts on both of my legs, and then became a chubby kid, which led me to feel full of shame at a very early age. And that scene where I'm watching my mother put on her girdle she was a heavy woman. My grandmother was a heavy woman. Like these messages just stay with you. And that little part that you read is sort of like, um, that was part of my journey also. Learning to live with my body. What is my body? How does it relate to my consciousness? Are those memories in our cells? Um, are, you know... Are we unconscious of things our bodies are telling us? I mean, there's just so much to talk about on that area. And it became that metaphor in the beginning of the book, my body, my map, because the map is also a metaphor because this is a journey through many travels and eventually the Everest expedition. 
Well, as you said, life is a journey. And <laughs> as young children, um, we sometimes don't realize what is what we're taking with us through our lives and how it's going to really affect us as we grow, as we get older, and some of the things that we do. And one of the things is you said you grew up, you know, a chubby child. When you were in college, you went off to, or before college, uh, you had a few jobs. And one of them, uh, you became a vegetarian before that, and you went to Switzerland and you lost a lot of weight, yet you still felt confined. Can you sort of uh, walk us through that? Because I know for myself growing up as a chubby child and always thinking of myself as that, and it really resonates through so much of your life that it's sometimes difficult or always difficult to look at yourself as anything else. So yeah. tell us how you felt when you were in Switzerland and you had lost all this weight and yet you still felt confined. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, you talk to so many women, you know, so many of us have body issues, food issues, and, you know, mine were imprinted so young. So I felt shame as a fat girl. And then I became a thin girl with who, you know, disordered eating, but I didn't feel good about myself. It doesn't like change who you are you know, that's a much deeper change that needs to happen. It was all this external stuff. And the thing with the girdle, the girdle was a metaphor for, um, you know, am I going to be confined in some ways, like I saw my mother and grandma, or do I have the ability to bust out? You know, they still followed Moors. Um, they were, my, my grandmother was German, you know, very, had a, you know, rigid view of life raised my mother that way, her German tongue, uh, mother tongue was German. And so there's also that question of, you know, girdle is staying confined or breaking out with the body. It's so much harder as with any change, like, but for me, I'm always, you know, another thread through the book is I'm always looking to change and I'm always wanting to change. And I mean, that's part of the question I ask readers is, how much do you want to change and how much do you want to stay in your safe zone or bust out of those, of those thoughts? In the end, I also recognize that a lot of it's in my head. It's thoughts, you know, it's not a matter of necessarily changing your place. We also have to work on changing our minds and our thoughts. Well, that's almost the, the first place that we really have to get comfortable within ourselves in order to be able to make that further step. One of the other aspects that you fold into this, um, as I said, you talk a lot about yourself, you talk a lot about your family and the influence. You were about six or seven when your grandmother used to come on weekends. She used to come and, and, and visit. Your father wasn't exactly happy about that and his mother-in-law coming. And you asked, well, what about your mother? And he gave you a story of his background, which you hadn't known before. And that had to do with the Holocaust and his survival and what happened to his family. You talk about how that also framed a lot of who you were and took you a long time to, and the term isn't come to terms with it, but there's a lot, you know, we say never forget, yet you say something about the, the uh, children of Holocaust survivors. How did that frame how you were thinking? And it sort of goes through the theme of a lot of what you did. Yes. Um... So I learned that story around six. It's it's a memory that I have because it impacted me so greatly. It really felt like my world changed in an instant. I had a regular family, I thought. And then I learned my father 
his entire family was murdered and he's the only survivor. And I couldn't look at him the same afterwards. How could anything in my life compare to what he had been through? How could I, you know, ask for any attention? How it, it, it was just kind of a shocking thing. And it also kind of at a very, too young age, in my opinion, um, <laughs> you know, made me see the world differently as something untrustworthy and as something that would make me have to take care of myself and protect myself. And, you know, I wanted to contribute to the literature of children of survivors, because now that there are fewer and fewer survivors left to tell their own stories, the children were affected too in different ways, very different ways. So this is just my one version of a story of how I was affected by my father's story. And I think those stories are important because um, we can learn from them. The whole idea of never forget, we're kind of going through now. Like what made the world so perilous and the world feels perilous now? How are we going to react to that? What can we do about it? One thing my father did as a survivor is he decided he would do everything in his power to make the world a better place. So he was a, an advocate. He worked for a lot of human rights issues and that had a huge influence on me and made that one of my life missions. So you know, that's a question too. What do we do with this information? That's what he did. And that's how he influenced me. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we've learned throughout life and what you're doing here is sharing stories is so important because not everyone has the same experience. Not everyone has the same results but some people have a piece of it and they don't know, they feel that they're the only ones who feel this way. And then there's guilt or there's, you know, they put it in, in a box as you talk about, you know, boxes, they put it away someplace. And when we share stories, not everyone's going to agree, but it, it brings out, it, it validates so much in who we are, how we're thinking, and oh, wow, somebody else feels a little bit the way I did. And all these small things, which are big things, affect us through through our lives. Yeah. Um, I want to now kind of revert to or add in um, tap dancing. <laughs> Tell me how that your love for dance and your feeling of growing up where you're a chubby kid, you're this kid, you don't trust, whatever, but you want to learn how to dance. Jazz is something and tap dancing. Your mother thinks you're, nah, this isn't, you know, how you're going to make a living. Tell us how to tap dancing really got you through a lot? I think when I discovered dance, um, it's sort of like what we were talking about before. I could get out of my head. I could just be, I could feel free. And I just loved every minute of it. So I did take some early dance classes. My grandmother was a dancer in Germany and she fled the Nazis in 1933. So she, she did put me in class when I was two. I lasted till about six, but then rediscovered dance at around 14. And then I just became obsessed and, you know, went after school every day um, because of how it made me feel. And I think it's that union again of really living in your body and so dance became a thread throughout the book because it represents freedom, which I think we all search for. We all search for our happy places. Dance is a happy place for me and mountains is a happy place. So it was important for me to fuse those con concepts, um, which happens in the book <laughs> and yes. in the title. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why it's in the title. Um, <laughs> and, and so you had an experience also when you were about 14 or 16 where your mother takes you to a gynecologist 
for the first time. <laughs> and your experience was, and it was a woman, a female gynecologist, which there weren't many back in the day. Um, I don't know that there are a heck of a lot. There's a lot more these days. Uh, that experience changed you and your trajectory as to who you might want to become. What was that experience like? So a lot of the things I write about in the book are these single moments where my life really changes because of my reaction to them. And my reaction might be a little, um, uh, uh, you know, out of proportion. I don't know. I have this one bad GYN appointment. I'm 16, my first appointment. I'm so excited. She's a woman. I was already a feminist because I had a single mother. I had a single grandmother and I felt really dismissed. I, I, um, felt almost like scorn <laughs> from her with the questions I was asking. And, you know, as soon as we left, I thought to myself, maybe I could do what she's doing, but I would, you know, really listen to teenagers. I would really respect women. I would make them feel good about their bodies. And that stuck with me and is what I decided to do and did. <laughs> so I think a lot of the things that happened to me in the book, I have an idea or a reaction. Um, but sometimes I think maybe other people might have not necessarily gone to the extreme length I do when I get an idea. So that 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 was that was the plant of an idea to become a GYN. And I actually went to medical school to become a GYN. I didn't go to become a physician. <laughs> like that was my motivation. And, you know, this may or may not relate to one of your other questions, but it was when I was just watching a slideshow that a researcher was giving one day during a summer program about Tibet. And I said, I'm going there and made that happen. So it's just another example of reactions. But I think we need to listen to our gut sometimes. And I don't know if those are callings or just passions or curiosity, definitely a lot of curiosity. Um, but that's what led me to gynecology. Well, there's one other topic before we get into hiking and Everest um, that played a huge part in, in what you've done and um, how you think, and that is religion. Mm -hmm. Your father, I believe, grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family. And again, it wasn't something that you knew about until he told the story. Um, and you kind of struggled with where you wanted to be. Uh, your mom sent you and your brother to an Orthodox school because she didn't like the, the school that you were originally going to. And then you also found Buddhism and meditation. Can you tell us how that kind of evolved and sort of led you to some of the things that we're going to talk about um, as far as the expedition? Yes. Um, so religion, because uh, we ended up in an Orthodox school, um, it was I was transferred in the middle of second grade. Um, and then immersed in that world. But at home, we weren't observant at all. My father had grown up that way, but that, by that point, they were uh, separated already, my parents. And my mother was also was um, exposed to orthodoxy as a young girl in Israel, but didn't practice. And that was a conflict, you know, what you experience at home and what you're learning at school. And I had to figure out what did I believe and what did I want to do. And at around 11, I decided to be Orthodox too, which lasted a couple of years. Um, and then, you know, decided not to be. And I think, I think we, you know, many of us have those questions, the religion we grew up with, how do we want to practice? What do we believe? And that carries through the book, true, as I trek through Nepal and I'm exposed to Buddhism, but I'm always very firmly rooted in my Jewish roots as well. And um, that's just a huge part of who I am. And, um, you know, 
how I believe and what I practice just continues to evolve, you know, throughout life. Well, one of your first hikes was Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, and from there, um, Tibet, was it Tibet or Nepal? Nepal. Nepal. Thank you. Um, how did you go from hiking Colorado to saying, well, you wanted to go to Tibet, but you couldn't get in there. It was difficult. So you wound up in Nepal and your mother thought you were nuts. <laughs> um, and you were going off by yourself. You hadn't done this before. Did you have fear about doing it? Trepidation? What were you looking to achieve? And I don't mean a goal like, oh, I want to run 10 miles and, you know, every day I'll do this. What were you hoping to get out of this? Yeah. So it all starts with that slideshow I watched in Colorado about Tibet and this feeling I had that I'm going to go there. So that following year, I was applying to medical school and waitressing and planning this trip I was going to take. And um, it ended up being to Nepal. I just read a guidebook. I read some other books. And I was determined to go because of how I felt in the mountains. I just, you know, in, discovered in Colorado that I lit up in the mountains. And I saw those mountains in Tibet in, in those pictures. And I thought, gosh, you know, how would I feel there? What would I feel like next to the tallest mountains in the world? I didn't have much money. I had to borrow a backpack. I was saving up all year. I bought some specialized camera lenses, but didn't have the money for a camera and borrowed the camera body and took off on my own. And um, I remember being at the airport with my mom and two best friends who just thought I was nuts. And I remember getting on the plane and feeling so sure of myself, like, oh, now I can relax. I'm going on this journey. I don't know why I wasn't more nervous. It just felt right. I guess sometimes when you do things in your life and it's you're you're just in some kind of zone, it's the right place where you're supposed to be. So I think I was nervous about a lot of details, but I was just very determined. Well, you you use the word immersion a lot throughout yeah. the book. How did that play into your first hike? Um, you, uh, talk about, uh, it wasn't a backpack. You used something else, which really wasn't meant for hiking the way you were hiking. Um, talk to us about the word immersion. So I use the a word immersion in one of my early chapters. Um, I, I frame it around language immersion because I was exposed to all my parents and grandparents mother's different languages, which were a lot. And, you know, when we learn languages and we're immersed, you know, we, we build clarity and suddenly we gain a new understanding, right. As we absorb that language. So I use that as a sort of metaphor to different things we seek in life that give us that same feeling, or at least what I saw and gave me that feeling. So dance was an immersion going to the mountains was an immersion. Another way to say that is someone's passion. You know, they may be curious and follow passions or obsessions. So I just use the word immersion um, because there's something whole about that experience and it can be eye-opening and change you. Again, I was always someone kind of looking for, for seeking change, maybe a seeker or searcher. Um, so I like this visual of immerse Im immersion and it, 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 it worked, it ended up being a good metaphor to use over and again. Okay. So on your first hike, um, you were alone and you wound up meeting quite a number of people. One, uh, man in particular, uh, Robert really played a big part in your life uh, a couple of years later. Tell yes. us how this, you you spent that time trekking and hiking and doing things you never really 
uh, planned on doing. Uh, you meet this guy, you part when you come home, you're back in school, you've just started medical school, and you get a message from him. Tell us about that, because that was the start of tap dancing on Everest. <laughs> yes. So during trekking, I met various people and different characters in the book. It, I got to spend a few months there. One of the great parts was learning to just make decisions by myself, being alone and isolated and having to make big life decisions. Towards the end of my trekking, I met a few Everest climbers in the Everest region, and Robert was one of them. We hiked together a little bit, and we um, had um, a, a brief fling in the mountains. And um, he uh, became a friend, as did some of the other climbers I met. And yeah, about a year into, he was determined to return to an Everest expedition. He had been on this one when I met him where they did not get, no, but the team did not get to the top and he was determined to come back. So about a year into medical school, I got an invitation from him to join the climb that we eventually went on, which as you said, would be at the end of my third year of medical school. So of course, at first I thought there was no way I could do that. How would I take care of climbers <laughs> as a medical student? By the way, I was in the Bronx, New York City, not someone in the wilderness every weekend, <laughs> lear learning wilderness, you know, survival skills. Um, but that became my challenge that I couldn't resist. So I worked towards Boeing and, and the expedition is the frame of the book. And you were the only woman. Yes. Um, involved in this. You're 25 years old. You are tasked with the medical, with the nutrition, with their whole um, training and putting out, you know, the map for them. Again, we talk about map. Um, tell us what it was like when you not only said yes, you got the medical school to... Um, take this on also as part of what you were studying, part of your studies. Uh, there was a lot of money that was raised for this expedition. Tell us how you felt when you first, when, when, when all of you first left and you realized that this is real. Yes, I felt um, a bit terrified. <laughs> so, <laughs> through all the preparation, um, I felt terrified. In fact, I talk about going to therapy uh, a couple of months before the expedition, thinking this is ridiculous. I should not be going. I should not have the responsibility of caring for these climbers in a very remote valley in Tibet where we would have no chance of rescue. Um, and that's part of why I wrote the book. Things did not go completely well, right? But um, you could also say we were lucky in some respects. But I think the point to me and the lesson to me is that um, it's okay to do things sometimes that terrify us. And it's okay to say yes to opportunities that come your way, even when you don't think you're the most qualified you don't think you're the best for the role. Maybe you have qualities you don't see in yourself. In this instance, Robert saw some things in me I didn't. And um, we definitely grow from those experiences. You know, we, it doesn't mean it's easy. It's very hard. That entire experience of preparing for the trip and being on the trip was very, very hard. But look at me now. It's it's had such an influence. I had to write about it 36 years later, because that message to me I think is valuable. Um, we can do things um, that we yes, think we, we can't. Yes, know? we can, and that's the thing. We sometimes, a lot of times, let our fears and our um, saying, "No, nah, we're not good enough. We we can't stop us from doing things that." are amazing 
and will just push us forward and lead us into something new. And I don't want to uh, miss talking about the fact that you were the only woman, you're out in the middle of nowhere, all right, Everest, um, <laughs> and, and it's seriously. And some of the experiences, um, you know, just bodily functions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as you say, you talk about getting a period, using tampons. I mean, you're in the midst of middle of nowhere. Um, how did you get yourself to feel comfortable and realize that um, although you thought they really didn't see you until later on, um, that you could feel comfortable being a woman amongst all these men? Yes. So the other point relating to the, what we were talking about before is just that women, as women, we often underestimate ourselves. And, and that's why the message is about going forward anyway, I think for women in particular are important. And as women, especially maybe less nowadays, but we were often, you know, the only one in the room or, and none of that's easy. It's never easy to be the only one of anything in a room. I felt, again, I, I felt such feminism. I felt like I'm going to be, you know, show them I'm a powerful woman. Like, I don't want to fail on behalf of all women. <laughs> you know, you sometimes feel that way when you're part of a group that you're representing them and you have to, you know, really represent the whole group well. The other thing, though, um, so the reason I could write this book is I had such detailed journals from all those years. And part of why I did is I felt I was alone a lot. Where was I going to put all these thoughts and feelings? I put them in a journal. The guys didn't want to sit around and talk about all my thoughts and feelings, right? I'm going to put that in a book. And as women, we process with each other all the time, right? We have to talk to each other every day. We have to talk to, I mean, many people, I shouldn't generalize, but many of us want to talk to our friends. Here, you have a podcast that can substitute for talking to friends. You want to process the world. We like to, to do that with others. Um, and I, ha I felt that I had to do a lot of that on my own. And the other thing I put into the book is, is the, some, just some of the times I was harassed over my lifespan as a woman and the book ends at 25, but that includes, you know, an incident at around, you know, six or seven, and then at 15 and then here in Tibet, I was harassed and by locals. I feel like that's universal for women. You know, I, I include it because most things I include is because I think they're universal experiences. Not to say, hey, look, this happened to me. But like, as you read about it happening to me, you're remembering when it happened to you. Or at least if you're a man, you're learning about what women go through and how they really experience life and all of these kind of challenges that you may not know about. And in terms of the bodily functions, I just felt like, hey, I'm a gynecologist, I'm a doctor. If I don't talk about it, who's going to talk about it? Maybe, you know, readers won't relate to those parts, but I think it's just a way of normalizing our physiologic <laughs> functions that we, you know, that our bodies have to go through. Well, there's two more items that I want to talk about. And one is the fact that um, you're medical skills and your medical knowledge and everything that you studied prior to going on this expedition played a huge role in saving three of the men um, who were climbers, Robert, Ed, and Stephen. Um, and when you met up with some doctors, a few days later and asked them to take a look, had you done it properly, the frostbite and so on. And they were amazed at what you had done. So a woman who went up and who really wasn't paid that much attention was paid a lot of attention afterwards, not because you wanted the fame, because you did your job, because you studied, you learned what to do, and you were able to go in and do it as horrifying and as 
scary um, as it might have been. How did that make you feel? Well, that's another reason I wrote the book was just to highlight someone in the background. I mean, the doctor on a team is not someone that does get really mentioned much or attention, which is fine. You know, the climbers are sort of the heroes doing amazing mountaineering feats, which is, you know, incredible. But I wanted to write about what else is going on on a trip and what does it feel like to be in the background and kind of in the shadow, but doing your job and support excuse me, supporting the team. And, you know, <laughs> excuse me. Part of what I did throughout the trip is quiz myself on all the disasters that could happen to make sure I'd be ready. I slept with my stethoscope in my bag to make sure it was warm, ready to use, <laughs> you know, because metal can get stiff in the cold my blood pressure cuffs in the in the sleeping bag. So of course, treating injuries was a bit terrifying. And when the doctors, you know, were there to say that I had done everything right, it was, I could finally breathe after, you know, this whole experience of stretching myself again. Um, it, it was It was just incredibly reassuring for the climbers and for me. Okay. Um, yeah, you say that, you know, they, they started treating you like a person regardless of gender. Um, I'd also like to talk to you about, I mentioned at the beginning that you wrote the post row monologues. Um, can you just briefly why and sure. why was it so important? So my whole career has been OBGYN and by nature of that field, and also I, I'm a subspecialist in, in family planning, which is contraception and abortion care and research, um, you, you naturally become an advocate. So I became a reproductive rights advocate and work with community groups um, to educate about these issues. I've written several op-eds and after the Dobbs decision, I was in a meeting with advocates. We were discussing how we would teach about the ramifications of, of limited abortion access. And I got the idea to write the play. And because I was working with this group, National Council of Jewish Women, they said, okay, we have a date in six weeks. <laughs> so we did, we, we had professional performers do that first performance very quickly. I did some additional interviews with people in the community to create these composite fictional characters. And it's another form of storytelling. It's sort of, you know, the book and the play sort of go together in the sense that I truly believe if we delve deeply into humanity, put human face on these stories, that they um, are accepted in a different way than just reading a news report. You know, we read a lot of news about what's happening with abortion bans and restrictions and the people affected. But there's something about being in a theater and seeing people telling their heartfelt story. And it, it became a powerful play that resonated. And um, so it's been performed in a couple of cities now. And one of the things you say is the risk we take to become our truest selves Mimi, where can people uh, find out more about you? I have a website, mimizemanmd.com, M-I-M-I-Z-I-E-M-A-N-M-D.com. Uh, the book, there's a lot of, there's information there about tap dancing on Everest and, um, and, and, and as well as Amazon, there, there are a lot of reviews. <laughs> so you can see some reader feedback too. Mimi, I want to thank you. It's Tap Dancing on Everest, A Young Doctor's Unlikely Adventure, um, and not just a great story. It's, it's as I we started out, as we share our stories, it affects so many. So thank you for using your voice and sharing your story. Thanks so much for having me, Sylvia. I really appreciate it. 
My pleasure. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms. And of course, our website, sylviaandme.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, stay tuned. 